Okay, we can get started. What questions do people have? Yeah. Great idea. Let's uh, pull up some reaction off the internet. Um, chemical reaction, right? Let's look up, this is the Wikipedia app for us. Does it have examples? How about this one right here? NaCl plus silver nitrate forming sodium nitrate plus AgCl. Let's take a look at that one. So the equation was this, it said NaCl um, plus silver nitrate, AgNO3, goes to no, NaNO3, NaO3 plus AgCl. So first off, is this a reaction that is a redox reaction? What's the difference between a, well, what, is, what, what must a redox reaction have? You have to have something reduced and something oxidized. Is that happening here? Right? We just pulled something off the internet. There's no guarantee that's happening. So let's take a look at it. So if I gave you this equation and I said on the test, can you identify a species as being oxidized, reduced, or not? What's the approach? How do you start on something like this? Brad, what do you do? You write oxidation states. Yeah, start by writing the oxidation states above it. Right, so sodium chloride, that's definitely a plus one and a minus one. Silver, that's gonna be plus one. If you remember from chemistry, this uh, polyanion has a negative one charge. If you didn't remember that, you could have written out that this is minus six and that's plus five, and so that adds up to the total plus six, right? Um, so again, oxygen's minus two, but there's three of them. Okay, let's keep on going. This is plus one, plus five, minus two plus one, minus one. So is this a redox reaction? It's not a redox reaction. Nothing changed oxidation state, right? Nothing changed oxidation state. So let's pull up a common battery. Let's look up a battery reaction. Since we know batteries have to exchange electrons, that's how they work, right? Let's look up a battery reaction. Professor? Yeah. Do we need to keep our um, uh, Table. Your periodic table? Yeah. yeah, you can keep that. And if, if you haven't picked one up, I do have a few extras, and I brought a few here today. I'll have a couple uh, on Friday as well. Yeah, they're, yours. they're really nice too. Um, battery reaction, okay. What will Google Images give us for battery reaction? Anything? How about this one, lead acid battery. Right, this is a lead acid battery. So let's identify what's going on in a lead acid battery and write half cell reactions for it. Okay, so you've got lead plus lead oxide. Lead plus lead, uh, oops, lead oxide, right? Uh, plus H2SO4, plus two moles of H2SO4 yields two lead sulfate plus two H2O. Right? So that, that reaction, let's do the same thing as before. First off, you've got elemental lead, so that's a zero charge. You've got PbO2, what must be the charge of lead? It's gotta be a plus four, because there's two oxygens, that adds up to minus four, right? You've got oxygen, SO4, so this is gonna be minus two. H is almost always plus one. What does that make the S there? You've got a total of four times negative two, that's negative eight. So this must be plus six on the sulfur. That's a common oxidation state for sulfur. And again, if you didn't know that, a good way to guess it, you can look at your periodic table and see that sulfur is right here. So basically, first to become plus six, it loses all of these three P electrons and three S electrons, right? To become positive six charged, right? Let's keep going. Over here now, we've got minus eight, Let's assume that sulfur is unchanging. I don't think it's changing. Plus six. What is lead then? That's, that, it became plus two, right? And then this is still plus one. That's minus two. So you guys tell me what has been oxidized and what has been reduced. 
lead has done both, right? You go from lead on the left-hand side equation, where it's zero and in a plus four state, depending on which ion you're talking about, or which, uh, which chemical species, right, which reactant. On the other side, they've both changed to lead plus two, right? So let's break this up into road rather than whatever it's attached to, right? So I've got a buddy who just redid a car from like the 50s and spent a lot of money putting a whole new bucket in this thing because it was just basically gone to crap. And he doesn't want to do that again. So he wants to put a big block of something on it and weld it to the chassis such that you, such that you don't have to worry about it corroding again. Instead, the sacrificial anode will corrode. And if you need to switch that out, that's not a big deal, right? So if you want something to corrode, and you don't want the other thing to corrode, do you want it to be oxidized or reduced? Generally, you want it to be oxidized. And the, you know, the, the name sacrificial anode gives that away. We know that oxidation occurs at the anode. We want to intentionally make it an anode where, where oxidation is going to occur at, right? So, um, you know, what, what metal do we want to protect? Just what metal is of interest? Iron. iron. So let's say we want to protect iron, right? So if we were to write the reduction of iron, it might be something like Fe2 plus picking up two electrons to form iron metal. And we want that to happen, right? If there are iron ions, we want them to turn into iron metal. We don't want it to go the other way. We don't want iron metal turning into ions, which can be dissolved away or turned into oxide compounds, right, like rust. We want to prevent that. So we would go over here to our free energy chapter We'd pull up our standard reduction potentials. By the way, you won't need to put this on your note sheet. Any information that you would need from this table is on the test already, right? So iron, you look it up and it's right here. And it's negative 0.44 volts. So negative 0.44 volts, return one review. The voltage associated with this reaction equals negative 0.44 volts. Does that reaction want to happen? Is it spontaneous? Negative voltage is not spontaneous. So um, iron, you know, just from the standard half cell reaction, you can't sell anything until you pair it up with something, but it's not looking good so far because this already doesn't want to happen, right? But it totally depends on what it's paired up with. So what would you pair it up with? If you wanted to make a sacrificial anode, you want something higher or lower? You want something lower because things that are lower on the table get oxidized. Right now, these are all written as reductions. If we want them oxidized, <clears throat> If I want to make, we want it to be reduced, we want iron to be reduced, then we want the things below it to be oxidized. So they are currently more negative, which means when we flip them, they'll be more positive and more spontaneous, right? So you can pick anything down here. You can pick chromium, zinc, aluminum, magnesium. Common materials for sacrificial anodes are things like zinc and magnesium, right? They, they corrode like crazy instead of the other things. So let's do zinc real quick. Let's assume we're gonna pair it up with zinc. All right, so currently, zinc 2 plus, if you add two electrons to it, you'll form zinc metal, right? The voltage associated with that as a reduction potential is negative 0 0.763. This. Negative 0 0.763, right? When we write this as an oxidation, it's now going to be zinc becoming zinc ions, meaning it's corroding away and giving up electrons as it does so, those electrons will go back to the ion that we want to prevent. We flip this voltage, it becomes a positive 0.763 volts. And now when we add together our iron and our zinc written as an oxidation, we get a positive voltage, right? It's positive 0.3 something, right? So our, our delta V naught is now greater than zero. So it's, it's spontaneous, right? Zinc will corrode and iron will not. So you, we could have chosen other things. It didn't have to be zinc. It just needed to be something below iron on the reduction table. table. Yeah? So as long as it's smaller or more negative? As you write it, the way that we wrote this, remember, we, uh, we wrote zinc twice because we wanted to write it. We first wrote it as a reduction. Then we, we wanted it to be oxidized. We flipped it. Now when I add these two things together, my let's just write it. We end up with zinc, metal, combining with iron ions to form zinc ions plus iron metal, right? That's what we want. That's the reaction we want, right? Since that's the reaction we want as it's written, when we add these up, if our delta V naught is greater than zero, then you've done it right. Because greater than zero means spontaneous. We want to spontaneously consume zinc 
and create iron metal. If you add this up and you get a negative value, then you did it wrong, right? So what if I did this? I've done this in the past on exams. What if I gave you a standard reduction potential table, right? But instead of as a reduction table, I gave you an oxidation potential, which means for every one of these things, I just flipped them. I said potassium yields potassium ions plus electrons. Now it's a positive voltage. So I get, I give the exact same table. It's just flipped as an oxidation, right? So instead of thinking, oh, it's the one below it, I think what's safer to do is to remember that every redox reaction has to have a reduced you know, ion and an oxidized ion. You're just going to add those together. And when you add it together, if you get the species you know, that you want, you add the voltages. And if it's positive, then it's going to happen. If it's negative, then you did it backwards. Okay. Yeah, question? So in a question like on the, um, on the practice test where it says, like, um, I'll get it. Like when it says we need to re reverse spontaneity. Reverse spontaneity, okay. It, like when it gives us the like concentrations, I know that has to do with Q, but I don't know how to spontaneity. Can you see the exact question? It says at room temperature, a galvanic cell with PD and AU is constructed with one N concentrations of PD two plus and AUCL. It's one molar concentration? Yeah. Okay. Um, what does AU does it say? Or is, we're going to solve for A in order to reverse the spontaneity? So it says they're both, um, they're both one molar. Um, so, so PD2 plus N gold 3 plus or 2 plus? What is it? AUCL4 negative. And AUCL4 negative yeah. is one molar as well. Yeah. Okay. So now, <laughs> leaving. AUCL for negative at 1M, so what must be the two ions in order to reverse the spontaneity? Okay, so how would you go about this? You wanted to reverse the spontaneity. Well, first off, what would you do with this? The very first thing you'd do, like all these questions, you start with calculating delta V naught. You get delta V naught by writing a reduction and an oxidation, right? So you'd go back to your table. Let me just grab it and I'll drop it in here so we don't have to keep going back. You'd look at this and you'd say, okay, was it AUCL one minus or four minus? One minus. One minus, that makes sense. ACL. So that means it's AU three plus. Well, okay. so CL is the subscript on the core. Sorry, can I just see this real quick? Yeah. Okay, four chlorine ions and overall it has one minus direction. Okay, yeah. so yeah, it is gold three plus. So there's a four and that is a subscript. Okay. So gold is three plus, right, in, the, in this ion. So the question is, to what should we adjust this value? It's currently at one molar, the palladium two plus. Can we adjust that to some value to reverse the spontaneity, right? So let's write this out. Which one is gonna be oxidized, which one is gonna be reduced? Well, here's our gold, gold three plus. It's at the very top of this, right? Palladium is not listed in this chart. Is palladium given in the problem there? It is, um, it is So uh, V naught for that is equal to 0 0.98. So which one is more negative? Palladium. So gold is actually more of a noble metal than palladium, right? So let's flip the palladium, right? When we flip it, we now have um, palladium creating um, palladium ions, two plus, plus two electrons, and our V naught is equal to negative 0 0.98. Can we add these together? Not yet. What do we need to do? Remember, when you this is critical. When you add your redox re reactions together, you have to have electrons cancel. Right now, we've got three electrons from our gold. We only got two on our palladium. So what do we have to do to this reaction? Yeah, mul let's multiply gold by two. Multiply the palladium by three. Right. So I'm gonna write it over here. I guess let's do three gold ions. Right. Um, plus. Oh, I'm sorry, two. I, I messed that up. We're going to multiply this by two. Two gold ions plus six electrons, right, yields two gold metal, right? Meanwhile, three palladium metal yields six electrons plus three palladium ions. Okay? That makes sense, that step? What we did not do, and this is critical, is you do not multiply these voltages by two and three, respectively. You leave them just as they are, right? But now we can go ahead and add them together. 
Um, when we do so, the electrons cancel out on either side of the equation, and we're left with just two gold ions, that's three plus ions, plus three palladium yields two gold plus three palladium two plus ions. Right? Anybody have any questions so far? Yeah, question? Do we even have the CO4? CO4 is a spectator ion in this one. It actually doesn't change any charge, right? Uh, the full chemical reaction, I think it's given here, it actually, it just stays minus one the whole time. So it's not involved, so we can ignore it, right? So if we, now that we've got this thing, we can, we can add it together, the electrons on both sides cancel. Now we can write the delta V naught. Delta V naught is gonna be equal to positive 1.42 volts plus a negative 0 0.98 volts, which equals, oops, not that one. I get 0.44, somebody else get that? And it's positive, meaning this reaction, 0.44 volts, this reaction as it's written wants to happen, right? But there's always the theoretical and the experimental component. This so far is just the theoretical, so let's figure out what the experimental component says. How do we do that? What's the equation we need to use? Yep. which is just the concentration of your oxidized metal over the concentration of your reduced metal. Okay, this looks familiar hopefully. Don? Uh, the reduced metal, you say electric, sometimes that's where it is. In this case it is, right? Here's our, here's our reaction, right? So we have products over here, we've got reactants over here. When we write Q, we write Q as products over reactants, right? Products over reactants. In this case, we can ignore solids like gold and palladium. Those just have an activity of one, so we don't have to write them in our Q expression. But ions, we have to substitute for their concentration. So, right, we're going to write down, for us, we're going to write down the concentration of palladium. Uh, that's supposed to be 2 plus, not 3 plus. Palladium 2 plus. And we need to raise that to the third power because that's what the coefficient is there, right? On the other side, it's going to be the concentration of gold ions, gold three plus, and that's going to be raised to the squared, right? So for us, we haven't written it yet, but there needs to be a three there and a two there. The generic expression, we leave those off with the understanding that you're going to have to figure out what they are, okay? So good catch, okay? Um, so now we can go ahead and finish this, right? We can say... Okay, equals 0 0.44 volts minus 8.314 times, does it give us the temperature in the problem? Room temp? Okay, so 298K, this is, remember this is joules per mole K. This is all going to be divided by, how many electrons are involved in this reaction? Six electrons times 96,500 coulombs per mole. This all comes out, this whole jumble here just gives you units of volts in the end, which is nice. Um, multiplied then by the natural log of, we're going to be adjusting our palladium value. It started out at one molar, but we're gonna be adjusting it. Right? So let's just leave it as concentration of palladium two plus to the cubed power. Gold does not get changed, so it's still at one molar. So it's just one squared, okay? and because we want to reverse the spontaneity of this reaction, we want to take this on the left-hand side and set it equal to zero volts. We want to figure out what do we have to adjust palladium to to bring that back down to zero, right? Because right now, if we plug it in with one molar here for palladium, you're going to get a non-zero value over here, meaning the reaction wants to happen. But the point of the question is to say, okay, if it's happening, what should we adjust the palladium ion concentration to to make it stop happening, right? To the point where it would actually start switching, right? So if you wanted to, you could replace instead of equal, you could use greater than, less than to figure out, okay, it needs to be greater than this or less than that. Let's just set it to equal for a moment, okay? Any questions on this? So you just plug that into your calculator. 0.44 is...
I plug it in, I solve for x, and I get 7.68 to the, to the 14th. Did I do that wrong? So you minus over the 44, and then you divide whatever that symbol. Yeah, let's, let's do the algebra together. Over that? <laughs> You'd say 0.4 exponentiate. That's correct. Um, so let's just multiply all this out. Somebody tell me what that is, I'll multiply it together. Point one five four zero. That has the units of volts multiplied by natural law, right? So let's bring that over. Zero point four four divided by zero point one five four. Our volts get canceled out, which is nice. Equals the natural log of the concentration of the palladium ions two plus just to the cube power. We take exponential both sides. What is e to this thing? 17.3969. Uh, you are right. That should be negative. That should be negative, which means that you can make them positive. Get the same thing. No, that's not the right value? No. Oh, what is it? You betrayed us, whoever said that. <laughs> hey, what is it? Four. Oh gosh, what is it now? All right, in scientific notation, one more time, 4.279. Okay, so we gotta bring that over here. 4.279. Ten to the negative three. Now plug that into the exponential. Somebody got that for us? It's a really big number. The big number, 4.54, e to the 44th. Um, uh, now you take the cubed root of that, it's going to make our lives a little bit better. It's still going to be a big number. Raise to the 1 over 3. To take the cubed root, just take it and raise it to the 1 third power. Yeah, and 7.68. So the same answer I got originally. So the concentration of palladium, in order to reverse this, if you wanted to reverse it, you would have to make this very concentrated, probably more concentrated than solubility limit would even allow, right? Because that's like moles per liter. You're probably going to have to be more concentrated than is feasible, what, which really means you can't make this reversible, right? What that's really saying, 7.688 times 10 to the 14th molar. Fair enough? Yeah, question? I have a few questions. So yeah. Good question. What does delta V, not delta V naught, but delta V equals zero, what does that mean? It means that this reaction right here is at equilibrium. There's the same amount going forward as there is backwards. When you take into account everything that's in the beaker, right? That it's at equal rates. So many then if you if you go beyond that, then you could actually start to reverse the reaction. Yeah, question? Yeah, can you go over how you choose which one goes on top inside of that water? Okay. So again, it's products over reactants for let me circle it the different color. This is our now chemical equation, right? So if we do products over reactants, our products are <coughs> palladium ions and gold metal. Since gold's a metal, it's a solid, we can just ignore it, right? Palladium, because it's an ion, we have to replace that with concentration. We raise it to the three power because it's got this three coefficient. Now these are our reactants. Palladium's a metal, we can ignore it. But gold ions, we have to use the concentration. Yeah? Go ahead. So before you set the thing to zero, and you said that you're going to set to zero, but we could also say like um, less or equal or more, uh, less or equal or more than equal. 
which corresponds to whether it goes one way or the other way? The, I think the easiest way to do this and not make a mistake is just to plug in a value, right? If I were you, I would um, take, well, actually, you know which one it is, right? Palla palladium was initially one, right? The palladium concentration was one molar, and we got a positive voltage because this is happening, right? So when we made that a much larger number, it trended towards zero. If we make that a larger number still, it would become spontaneous. So I think just thinking through it that way is probably the, the cleanest way to not make a mistake. Also, when you get an answer, you can really check to see if it makes sense. Uh -huh. For example, here, what would be a range for the test? While we're in the test, what would be the range that we would, that <coughs> range where the answer would make sense? Um, I'm actually surprised at this answer. I'm curious if I've made a mistake somewhere. I'll be posting the solutions or I'll have Emily post them because I'm, I'm surprised that that was such a large number. Because um, that, that's curious to me. When you see a concentration that doesn't, that's not meaningful, it makes me wonder if we made a mistake somewhere, but I don't see it. No, if you take a, let me just plug it in to make sure, but if you do 8.314 joules, and you divide that by 96,500 coulombs, so really joules per coulomb, that should give you volts. And, sorry, that's yeah, that's, that's volts. Let me just double check that one more time. Yeah, that's volts. So I'll double check that and see if, we, if there's something obviously wrong. This was from a previous test, so unless Emily modified it, which I doubt she did. Um, did it give a standard voltage in that problem, um, Anna? Let me just double check what it said real quick. Yeah, one volt, so it's the same. Oh. Okay, we do have a different one. Gold chloride is different. Okay, we have a different voltage here in the readout potential. So in the equation I gave for the this previous year's midterm, instead of using gold um, three plus, when you have gold uh, chloride involved in it, it's only one volt, right? So then the difference is, it makes, it makes a very big difference, right? So if you look at, uh, instead of using 1.4, you have one volt versus 0.98. So the difference in voltage is really small meaning that you don't need to have some crazy difference in concentration. It's probably some attainable value. So that, that's the difference. That's why we're getting a, a crazy value. So the fact that we're getting a crazy value is actually correct. We just used the wrong reduction potential because I didn't look at the question. That makes sense. Can I clarify anything? This muddied the water more than it's helped. I hate when I do that. Morgan? Uh, you said that we can make more spectacular ions. Why is that Great question. That's a really good question. Yep, I don't have a good answer to that. Okay. I don't have a good. I mean, so I don't have a good answer. Let me think about it. Okay. For this class, ignore the spectator ions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brendan. I could explain that um, because they. Uh, if you write out your full ion equation because they have the same charge and they haven't changed their identities, they, they exist on both sides of the equation. Okay. They use those ions and they cancel out. They can just cancel them out. I guess the question is then, why in the problem statement did I have a different delta V for gold chloride as opposed to this when it's the same oxidation state? It could be that I just messed up that when I wrote the question or I made something up. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I will try to get to the bottom of it and get you an answer by next class. Yeah. Other questions I can do on this? Yeah, Zach. Uh, so pure liquids uh, and, and for solids, we use an activity of one. If it's something dissolved in a liquid, like an ion dissolved in a liquid, that's when you use the concentrations. And for gases, we use partial pressures. Yeah, question? In the natural log, the first one, it says like ox over oxidation over reduction. So that's ox is the oxidized species. So whatever the ion is that's being oxidized as opposed to the one that's being reduced. But isn't um, gold being oxidized? Gold is being reduced. It's going from gold three plus to gold metal. That's a reduction. Yeah. I was looking at it in the Oh, no, you're fine. Any questions? Should we keep going, Travis?
like divided by a concentration. Yep, that'd be fair. Uh, that'd be fair game. Good questions? Keep going. Yeah. Okay. Other topic people have a question on. Yeah. You go ahead, Anna. Um, I know how to label face diagrams, but like the simple ones, I was like gonna <clears throat> ask you how do we label face diagrams and then identify the paratectic and paratectoid and you. Let me, let me hide this for a minute. Yeah, can I look at that real quick? That's perfect. I'll reproduce it and then we'll sketch it. But you guys could label it. It looks like this. It's like, what was the thing? It's like a one, it's one, two, one, two, right? That's right. So we're going from whatever, A to B. We might write down what those are in a minute, but for now, let's just write down A and B. You have the following. You've got this thing going on. You got one of these. Uh, Mark making a mistake. Okay. Okay. Oh, this is nasty. Okay, I think we're almost there. One, two, three, no, nope, there's one more. Okay, I might have made a mistake. Let me make sure this is right. I did, there's a problem somewhere already. Uh, hold on, almost there. One, two, three, one, two, three, okay. This would be easier just to pull up the figure, but we're this far. Let's finish this. All right. I think that that is it. So there's a little like triangle thing where that weird Oh yeah. Thank you for pointing out the weird triangle thing <laughs> up in the weird whatchamacallit. Okay. Woo! Okay, we have a phase diagram. This belongs to the barium oxide titanium system, right? So A is barium oxide, BAO, and TiO2. How would you go about labeling this monstrosity? Liquid is always a safe bet. Up top, you're going to have liquid, right? Now what do you do? Start busting out your Greek letters, right? So let's start on the left-hand side, right? This is, let's call this liquid plus alpha, which means that this thing must be a line compound on the far left. The pure barium oxide, we're going to call it alpha, right? That means that this must be alpha plus what? Call it beta, or what you fat? What? Five. Which one's five? Is that the one with like the vertical slash? Yeah. All right, we got that, which means what about this region right here? That's liquid plus phi. What is about this long sliver thing? That's just phi, which means this one up here is liquid plus phi. What about this big region? That's going to be phi plus liquid. Again, it's just left and right hand side. So you missed one. Oh gosh. <laughs> oh, okay. There, we didn't miss something. There is a line I missed, but it doesn't change anything. It changes it a little bit, right? Um, basically, and sometimes when they have this, it's a polytype, and I'll describe what that means in a second. Um, they'll call this alpha prime. So this would be like alpha prime plus V. Um, and then this one could be like alpha 2 prime. I'll describe what that means in just a moment. Okay? They're different phases. They're technically different phases. Yeah? Wait, how do you know what the um, line between the alpha and the uh, alpha? Is that the line? The, uh, yes. so you, which one? Is this a vertical line? Yeah. Well, we do the 1, 2, 1, 2 rule. You know that the liquid is a single phase. We decided this must be a single phase line compound. So the only way that. I'm not calling it. The only way that you have <laughs> single phase and single phase is by having two, two, one. Right? It's got to have the one, two, one, two rule. Right? Lots of questions. Hayden. 
Okay, so then why is the calculating uh, the alpha phase beyond the uh, phase? Why is that linked to force P even though the P plus theta is below that? Like what's going on here, you mean? Yeah. What's that? Why are we going to split? Yeah, yeah, why is it split like that? Like a saying that you like where there's a it's like see that diagram one more, more time that you look at? Yeah, there's like the second time. Yeah. 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 Why? Why is that there? Yeah. What is it? What is that talking source like? <laughs> let's do it and then we'll pull up the phase diagram and double check. Okay? So let's keep going. It's not obvious to me what it should represent, but at this second. Should we keep going? Okay. We don't know. We're going to find out. We're going to finish it and then we'll pull up the phase diagram and see what it writes. Okay? So we've got, what about this region right here? Phi plus, we don't know what. Like, oops. Let's go back to another color. Phi plus something. Now, anytime you see a vertical line, be suspicious. It's probably a line compound. But to be sure, start doing the math, right? Okay, if that's a line compound, this is a two phase, single phase, two phase. It's probably a single phase, two phase, single phase, two phase, single phase, which makes sense. Right? So double check it like that. Almost always, if it's a straight vertical line, it's a line compound. Almost always, right? So we can name this line compound something. Epsilon, one of these, right? So that means that this is epsilon plus another thing, gamma, which means this is gamma plus zeta, which means this is zeta plus iota. All right. I don't know if we can do that. I think I think that's the same thing. All right. Uh, what else we got? Kappa. Like so up here again. This is going to be a liquid plus iota. All right. This will be what region is this one? It's going to be zeta plus liquid. This one is going to be gamma and liquid. This little guy here is epsilon plus liquid. What about down here? What's that? That guy's gamma, this one's up zeta, this is iota. Right? What about down here in the bottom? That would be phi plus gamma. Whew, this is a nasty diagram. All right? Let's pull it up. So this is barium. We're going to look up the BAO TiO2. Is that what it was? BAO TiO2, I think it was. Phase diagram. Let's see what that funny business is up top. BAO and TiO2. This one doesn't go all the way. This only goes from 45 to 80. But, oh, there's another little phase there. That's right, that flat line, it had to be something. We didn't include this in our drawing. There's another little tiny section. There's a, what do we call that? That's a liquid plus what we were calling phi forming a new phase. What do we call that? A liquid and a solid forming a new solid? That's a paratectic. So there was a little paratectic phase that we missed when we drew this. But the zoomed in picture happened. So, so do we need to know by heart the whole You should know those reactions. If you don't, you got a sheet of paper. I'd write that down. What those things are. Yep, Lily? Okay, let's talk about those. And oftentimes they're shown flat, horizontal, and they're shown with dashed lines, like right here. Right? What they usually correspond to is what's called a polytype. Is a polytype is when something doesn't change composition, but it does change crystal structure. So diamond and graphite, that's a polytype, right? They're, they're polytypes of the same atom, right? Uh, carbon nanotubes is also pure carbon. Buckyballs are pure carbon. So they oftentimes do these as a function of temperature. It converts between polytypes. Um, when you see it with a dashed line, it usually indicates that even though these are separate, technically distinct phases, they're pretty similar to one another, meaning um, Adam, like these phases, crystal structures are usually made up of polyhedra, um, polyhedron tilting. So if you have like a crystal structure, um, like this one, this is a great example. You could have two crystal structures which are technically different. They only differ in that one is tilted and one is not tilted. And so they'll do a dash line and say, all right, these are different phases, but they're not very different. So like when you have like these 
line. What is that horizontal line? Yeah. Is that the same as what is? No. The horizontal lines at the bottom of these key reactions indicate that that key reaction takes place all along the point, right here. For example, this is the eutectic temperature. This is the eutectic point. This is one of the eutectic points. There's one here. There's another one right there. This we decided we, we missed it. There's a small sliver that makes this a paratectic. Paratectic, paratectic, paratectic. So all the liquid in the two, like, if you have uh, liquid plus a uh, one, one. Up oh, here? Plus alpha, and then you cross the paratectic. Okay, um, it's crossing. <laughs> yeah, what happens? Will change to the alpha yeah, alpha. because do you have some liquid left over there? Sure. Right? You've got, uh, at say, this composition, if you're right there just above that line, you could apply the level rule. And the level rule says that this, like, you divide that up, that looks like you're like four fifths of the way across. So you have like 80% liquid and 20% of this alpha solid. But as soon as you go below that line, you're now going to have all that liquid converge to the eutectic structure of. You know, alpha plus beta. You know that, that dash actually here. So, That's. I can get rid of that. Okay. Yeah. Can you label the eutectic and the Can we label them? Sure. Yeah. Let's do that real quick. Then we'll do Takara's question. So okay. this right here, and this right here, we'll do red equals eutectic. Let's do green for our paratectic points. We decided. Let me to be technically correct. I need to draw the tiny little. Um, there's like a sliver of a second phase there. I'm just going to get rid of this because it's just going to be confusing. I don't recall what they did on that one. Oops. Okay, so what do we have now? We're labeling our paratectic points in green. So we've got one right there, one right there. Anything else that we're missing? No, there's one more right there. What about, there's one more thing that we should note here. Something else interesting that we need to note. Is there a eutectoid? Where is it? There is a eutectoid and it's right there. All right, so that equals eutectoid. What is a eutectoid? That's something that goes from one type of solid to two different types of solids. That's what happens there. Upon cooling, you've got pure what we're calling <coughs> and it turns into B plus gamma, two different solids. Right, so that's a eutectoid. And then the eutectic. Eutectic is a one liquid turning into two different solids. And paratectic, which we did in green, paratectic. Those are one solid and one liquid forming a new type of solid. Right? So You've got like liquid and iota turning into zeta at that point. So this is all as it cools? Yeah, the, uh, the, the eutectic, paratectic, all that nomenclature has to do with upon cooling, what's the reaction that takes place. Okay? So that's a nasty diagram, but it's one that you could do pretty, uh, without too much work. Like this part was messed up because I didn't zoom in close enough to see the interesting things are happening there. Do your hand over there. Remember your name? Corey. Corey. Um, what is the difference between a eutectoid and a paratectoid? What is the difference between a eutectoid and a paratectoid? So let's go down below and write this out. A paratectoid. Paratectoid. Well, a paratectic would be a liquid plus a solid forming a different type of solid. But this is oid. Anytime there's an oid, you get rid of all the liquid. So it's like two different solids forming a third solid. That's a paratectoid. A eutectoid is this. Gamma turning into two. It's just the reverse. But by nomenclature, we want to name these things differently. Okay? Any questions? Uh, Matt and Elder Brad. What would a paratectoid look like? So a paratectoid has two phases turning into one. So imagine that you had, um, let's just pull one up. This is what the internet exists for. Paratectoid phase diagram. Oh, it's the one we showed in class, right here. Right, you've got the gamma and the beta above, 
That's two different phases turning into one solid phase. So at that point, that reaction happens. Yeah? So generally, these are named by um, you're going down? Upon cooling, down. that's the convention for naming them. Um, for adding them in the back, there's an end. Okay, so that, does that clear it up? And then, uh, Aaron? Yeah. Uh, back on the phase diagram, why is there not a ejected above the in the middle of the right side? This one? Yeah, so those two. Where would it be? Like at where that yeah, touches? Right, yeah, right there. So a eutectic has to have one liquid converting to two different solids. And that's not happening here. Oh, yes. Right? You've got pure liquid turning into a solid and a liquid. So that's not a eutectic. Yeah, sorry. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. So on the other image, this one? So that would be going to say gamma plus beta to alpha? Gamma and beta, beta are in equilibrium with just alpha there. That's not cool. Yeah, what else is happening here? Are there other that other points that are interesting in the form? Uh, gamma, gamma and liquid so turning into beta, which we call a paratectic. Right? Liquid plus one solid turning into different solids a paratectic. And that's it there. That's all the interesting things in that diagram. So as for those compounded um, those compound lines, we don't have to know what compounds they Com are. Compound lines? Oh like what these things are? Yeah. Like the, the, the line compounds? Yeah. So another question that I could ask on this, and I probably did on that test question, I probably said identify the composition of one of those line compounds. It's probably something I asked. Right? So it depends on, is this plotted in weight percent or mole percent on the y axis, on the x axis? Mole percent Ti. So this is plotting mole percent Ti. So if I've drawn it even remotely accurately, and I have no idea if I did, then this is happening at about one quarter the way across. So what compound would that be? If that does happen at one quarter the way across, and I don't know if I've drawn it right, what compound would it be if it was one quarter the way across? That means that out of four moles of these different substances, three of them are barium oxide and one of them is TiO2, right? So that means that your compound for what we're calling phi, phi, if we had to estimate the chemical formula, we'd say that it is three of these BaOs and one of these TiO2. Or in other words, that's equal to um, Ba3 TiO, what is that, five, right? I have no idea if I've drawn that right, but that would be how you go about estimating it. You need to have the actual numbers to make the correct assessment. Uh, remember your name again? Pallon. Pallon. So the very category points make sense on this one because it's, yeah, yeah, right. Sorry. Okay. It's going from a single composition straight, like perpendicular. On this one, it looks to me like we have to switch yeah. the composition. The, the paratectic reaction only exists at this one point because as soon as you actually go below it, you, yeah. you leave that field. Oh, so it's it's still a paratectic point. Okay. Yeah. Just one point. Yeah. Uh, another hand, Scar. So okay, I just had. Uh, so if we were given the weight percent, would we have to take like a sample of like? Yeah, let's do TiO2 BaO phase diagram. Are any of these going to be in weight percent? They're oftentimes, let's see, mole percent. Is this one in? That's mole percent TiO2. They're probably all going to be. These are all mole percent. I'd have to dig it up. But yeah, you'd have to go, you'd have to convert the value from moles, or from weight into moles, and then take the ratio. And these aren't helping us, right? Um, by the way, that was at 50, that wasn't at 40. So I massively misdrew that. So they're both coming up. It's actually one to one. It's, it's a phase, that's a, I should know, it's a phase crystal structure. Okay? Other ones? Okay. Any questions? Should we keep moving? Mm -hmm. we're, we, we're half our time is down. Yeah, Conley? Uh, do you some examples on the mic? <laughs> yeah. We could use the same phase diagram, I guess, and let's just cool down, right? So what composition should we cool down at? Or which space do you want to go through? Go through something horrific? Let's go through, like, I don't know, like over here. Should we cool down there? Let's, second to the left? Oh, slightly to the left. Do you want to hit the line compound? Hits all the things. <laughs> I don't know what you mean by that. Um, 
let's sketch it here. This is pretty awful. I don't, I don't know how to make it more awful than this. I don't know how to do more awful than this. Let's do this. So right here, that's easy. That's just liquid, right? Um, I'm going to run out of space. All right, that's liquid. So you would just write liquid, and you'd write the composition. The composition is whatever that is, 60% of TiO2 or whatever that is, right? Now, as soon as you touch that line, what starts to happen? The, the very first little crystals, the seed crystals of the iota phase start to crystallize. By the time that you're just above this paratectic reaction right there, what does it look like? You've got the vast majority liquid. The lever rule says, to me, that's like 90 plus percent. So you've got a few tiny islands of iota, right, in an otherwise sea of liquid. And you could use the lever rule to actually figure out what these are if you wanted, right? But let's just keep sketching. When you cross below here, all of a sudden, what has changed? You're, li you're still going to have liquid there, but do you have any iota left? All of your iota is gone, and now you have, what's your, what's your lever rule approximately say you have? Mostly zeta. To me, that looks like, again, you're going to draw like a flat line to estimate this. Looks like maybe two-thirds zeta and one-third liquid. So at this point, if we're going to draw that, I'd say two-thirds zeta, one-third liquid. So you've got mostly... <laughs> That's ironic. <laughs> That's fantastic. The liquid. <laughs> Beautiful, right? So that happened. By the time you get down to here, how has it changed? Has it changed at all? It should have changed. Our lever rules changed, right? We now have even more solid, right, and even less liquid. So basically, if you're going to draw it there, you'd say, right, he's even more startled face, right? <laughs> even more solid, okay? And the composition is changing, right? The composition of the liquid is changing. The composition of the zeta phase is not changing, right? Because it's a line compound. So even though we went down. It didn't change the composition of this thing. The liquid composition is changing, right? And that makes sense because there's more solid forming, so it has to change. It's changing the composition by taking it from the liquid phase, all right? And then right here, what does it look like? Any liquid that you had left is now going to convert to a solid. It looks pretty equal to me. So you're going to have equal amounts of pro-eutectic, or pro-paratectic, excuse me. You're going to have equal amounts of pro-paratectic zeta, which was the startled face looking parts. And then you're going to have equal amounts of everything that was liquid before gets mixed into a mixture of this stuff. I don't know what we've done. All right. Overall, the fraction needs to be the same. The amount of zeta and the amount of gamma needs to be equal, right? So we'll say the white stuff is gamma, this stuff is zeta, because the lever rule says we're right in the middle. So however you need to draw it, and oftentimes just indicate it. So give, give it your best sketch, but just indicate what's going on. You're right down next to it. Yeah, Brennan? So in this case, because we went from having like 80% zeta to 50 zeta, we have less liquid than we had before. It shrunk. That's why I drew those a little bit smaller. They tend to shrink. And you actually see that happen. Yeah, they shrink, or even more likely, as you see what we saw in the uh, the homework. Let's see, let me pull it up. The SEM image. You'll see. So these were the pro eutectic phases, these big globs. But if you look, zoomed in on these, zoomed in, actually, you you dissolved out some of your secondary phase within them, and so you'd probably see that. So it's not like the whole glob would shrink. That can happen, but you'll actually precipitate out inside of these things little bits of your other phase. Okay. This is pretty cool. It's pretty cool that we can estimate what actually happens in nature just by very simple rules that we've learned so far, like things like surface energy, where things want to grow, where they don't want to grow, diffusion limits. It's pretty great that we can estimate this. Uh, Arthur. Yeah, I just have a question. On the fourth bubble... In the fourth bubble... Changing some... Okay, so uh, in this region... Let me change colors once again. In this region right here, there is no liquid left. All of that liquid has been consumed to form gamma and zeta. Okay? No, but the one before that. Oh, okay, up above. At this point right here? Yeah. Okay, what's happening there? 
You said something about that there's still liquid, but it's like There's still some liquid there, but has the liquid amount changed from just above it? Yeah, it has, because the lever was no longer the same. There's less liquid, right? This one, the ratio to me looks like maybe like two thirds, but by this one, you're at like maybe 80% zeta. So the, so the frowny face is bigger? The frowny face is the eyeballs in the mouth got bigger because that's our solid phase, right? So it consumes some of the liquid for them to grow. Questions, Lily and then Takara? So when the zebra starts, do you only get those when you have liquid? Whenever you have the liquid at a single temperature splitting into two phases, like we saw here, that's not even technical in this case. But we still had the, the, the liquid converting to two different solids. Yeah. That would be the, the detective lamella structure. Mm -hmm. Interesting that it's happening here at a but that's the only thing that can happen. Yeah, uh, Hayden? Or, sorry, do you have a similar question? Uh, I think you answered it. I was going to ask what it would take if we talked with Paratactic. Oh, that'd be easy. Had this line, instead of being right here, we just crop right in the line compound. Uh, so, what happens there? You got a single phase. So if you if you cool down right onto this thing, you're just gonna end up with grains, right? Uh, I don't remember. Rob, at least. Um, what do you probably call on like the lamellar structure and striation? Is that accurate? Striation is probably a fair way to do it, but that's not what they call it. They call it lamellar or eutectic. Or then they have specific terms for it, like perlite in steel. Perlite is a type of steel. Again, we're going to come back to this later, but perlite steel, if you look at it, the reason they call it is because it looks a little bit like mother of pearl um, because it has these lamellas, right? It, it's just lamellar, but they say, oh, that looks kind of like mother of pearl steel. And so they've given some things weird names, but it's still the eutectic lamellar structure, even though this was a eutectoid that it went through. Yeah, go ahead, Anna. Um, sorry, this is on a totally different we are we ready to move on? Can we abandon microstructures? Or one last question, Allie? So, um, what's happening with the think bubble over there? What's happening with the what bubble? Uh, the think bubble. The think bubble? Yeah. Oh, this one over here. Yeah. Oh, basically, if you cooled it from pure liquid into this line compound in that single phase region, you would just have grains. You only have one phase, and so. You'd have different grains, right? These things can be oriented different ways, and that's why they are, there's not a single grain there because they hit grain boundaries. But it's just in grains. Nothing interesting. So the lines are grains. So the lines represent grain boundaries. Okay. Oh yeah, sorry. These lines here represent grain boundaries. So this would be like B phase, B phase, B phase, B phase, but in different crystallographic orientations. Uh, Arthur? I have a question. You did uh, for the last uh, purple thing. You did strike. On the inside the bubble, but is this stripes? Uh, these should have been out there. Oh, yeah, so these are the solid pro paratechnic phases. This is where liquid used to be. All that liquid switched to two phases. Anytime you have liquid switching to two phases at one temperature, it's just there's no time for it to diffuse and to make blobs. So you see the you see the type of stripes you want. Okay, so this has, so some of the stripes are going to be off. Correct. The white stuff I'm calling gamma, well, I guess, since this is white, I guess I should have drawn the gamma as a dark phase. And the white phase should have been the dark phase. Yeah. Uh, Brad? So, so what changed is the pre-eutectic multiple and zero, not the zero books. No, not in this class. Can you do that? Yeah, you can. In this class, don't learn it. And it has to do with the kinetics, and we barely touch kinetics as it is. We don't, we don't, we don't get justice. Uh, Kalani? Yes, would you call that the, like the zebra stuff in the factory? What's the difference then between the lamellar? Same thing. Same. Zebra is not an official term. <laughs> I just think that's easier to remember than lamellar or eutectic. <laughs> Please don't use that term like, why did a material science teacher tell us there's a zebra structure? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who Kalani is. Kalani who? Right? I have a question. So, yeah. for like the, the phase on gamma, they come down as a liquid yeah. and go, you enter into that phase. Is that right? zeta for liquid first? Right. Yep. And you're going, and let's say you come straight down. Right? Yep. Is it just the, the remaining liquid that both of them are right? yeah. Both of those solids, everything fits on At this composition, gamma. the only thing that's there is gamma. Sure. So, your zeta and liquid both transform. Okay. Transform that phase. Okay. Other questions? So, what does that go to? Pro-eutectic is the phase that forms before the eutectic. So where do we see that? We see that, lower this just a smidge. This is a eutectic. So if you cool down on the left of it or the right of it, you're gonna form a pro-eutectic phase, right? The second you touch this line, you start forming pro-eutectic gamma. 
the second touch, this line, you start going pretty tight to epsilon, right? So it's the solid phase that starts forming. It's part of the eutectic reaction, but it's happening before the eutectic temperature. Okay. Yeah, it's happening above it. Yeah. So could the iota just be fused out of the liquid before it hit the theta? So you're asking, if I'm right, you're asking about what's happening between this point and that point. Mm -hmm. So the iota phase was basically pure titanium, titanium oxide, excuse me, right? So that pure titanium oxide, by the time you go to here, you're left with liquid that has this composition and zeta that has this composition. So that pure um, iota must have picked up some bearing, right? It must have reacted some bearing because this is not pure titanium, this titanium is you know, 20% bearing or whatever it is. So it just re it's reactive. Yeah, yeah, really? Um, so what's the difference between proeutectic and hypo? Uh, hypo and hyperutectic are different. So there, there's proeutectic, there's hypoutectic, and hyperutectic. So how do you remember this? When you give your kid too much sugar, they're hyper, so it's got too much of something. So if you want to talk about too much, you're on the right hand side of your eutectic. This is a hyper eutectic composition between here and here. And then hypo, so this is like the hypoglycemic, don't have enough sugar. That's not enough. So you're to the left. This would be hypo eutectic compositions over here. So again, pro eutectic is what happens before the eutectic, I mean above in temperature, as you cool it down. Hypo and hyper have to do with the compositions that you're talking about. So um, your hypo would be, would be like below it, but to the left. Yeah, let me pull up a steel phase diagram. Uh, so right here, okay, we have, this is a eutectoid, these are hypo-eutectoid steels, anything from here to here is hyper-eutectoid steel, technically it's <coughs> like here, this is like the cast iron, right, and then this would be your pro-eutectoid phase of your hypo-eutectoid steel, but not full, okay? <laughs> Anything else? Anything else? I, I, supposedly these, these terminologies make life easier. I'm not, not convinced, but there you have it. Yeah, Allie? So hypos are smaller. Hypo is less, like hypoglycemic, none of sugar. So yeah. you're, you're to the left of your tectoid or your tectoid. But hyper is too much, you're to the right of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hypo what? Hypodermic needle. What's a hypodermic? How's that tie in? Hypo is not enough no, dermic needle? It's below the skin. I, I just figure hypodermic. Oh, you guys are making life harder. <laughs> no, stick with the sugar. Stick with the sugar down. Wait till you have four year olds. This will be a, the perfect way to remember it. Okay. Can I answer other questions on microstructure, at least? Or Elsa? Um, so, so, sorry. Just, is the hypo and hyper section above or below the <laughs> so it's not, no, neither. No. It's left right. Oh, it's just it's pro eutectic is above. Left right is hypo hyper. But is it below, it's it's below, it's it's below I don't think it has a name. That's just the eutectic. <laughs> I don't know the name for that. It's just eutectic structure. Yeah. Any other questions on structures? This has been good. These are good questions. Anything else? There's lots more in the test though. We got 50 minutes left. Anna, next question. So, this is number one on the practice test. What's it say? Um, it says WX or MO non-valent ion. Ah, that's perfect. That actually, we need to know that. That is on this test this year. So, basically, if you have ions of opposite charge, they're attracted, right? You got your positive, you got your negative. These things experience an attractive force one towards another, right? How big is that attractive force? Right? What is the expression that we learned in, in this class? F equals KE P1 Q2 over R. Yeah, let's just write K Q1 Q2 over R squared. That's like from physics, right? That's what you saw in physics for Coulomb attraction. In this class, we it's still Coulomb attraction, but we, we just introduce a few more terms. Or rather, we break K up into smaller things. And we say it's 1 over uh, 4 pi epsilon naught, this is the permittivity of free space, which is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, oh gosh, Newton per meters. 
Hold up. It's, there's one with Newtons that's more useful for you guys. Let me pull it real quick. Uh, permittivity of free space. The one with Newtons is the one we want. Uh, Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. No, no, wait. That's not it. Is that it? Oh, right here. Coulomb squared per Newton per meter squared. All right, that's, that's close. One more time. Coulomb squared per Newton per meter. All right? Cool. All right. Okay? We want that because we want force. We want the Newtons. Right? And we want to get rid of coulombs because that's what the electron charge is going to give us. So this is the one you want. Anyways, this is multiplied by Q1, Q2. That's the charge. But it's not just electrons. In physics, they're mostly talking about electrons. Here we're talking about ions, right? And these ions can be plus one, plus two, plus three, right? They can be multiple things. So let's say that it's monovalent for a minute. Z1 is the charge. Z2 is the charge of the other ion. So if these are both plus one and, plus, and minus one, right? multiplied by the charge of an electron, which is, let's just say, Q squared. Fundamental charge, which is 1.602, 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, right? There you've got coulomb times coulomb, so the coulomb squared, that's gonna cancel with these coulomb squared. You've got, oh, we're missing something, divided by R squared, the separation distance. So your meter's gonna cancel. You're going to be left with Newtons. Uh, meters don't cancel. You're left with Newtons. Where does it go? This must be squared. Otherwise, it wouldn't cancel and it needs to. That must be squared. It is. Right? Let's actually plug in. Let's do some examples. I want to make sure you guys know this. So let's say if. You have something like sodium chloride, which is plus one, minus one. What should be the attractive force? All right, let's actually plug this in. Oh, 10 to the negative 19, my bad. If you could ever can't understand something, please, 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 just call me out and say, I, can, I don't know what you wrote. I can't read your chicken scratch, right? I, I promise it's getting better. It's my fifth year doing this. And it's getting better, but it's it still needs to improve. What's the power on 8.85? Yeah, it's real bad. <laughs> I'd yell at my son for doing this, for not looping the two, because it's hard to tell. And then I don't do it. That's a two, so negative 12. Okay? So let's plug these in. What do you get for sodium chloride? What should be your approximate attractive value? Oh, you need to know R. We need to know what R is. I don't know what it is for certain chloride. Let's just put two angstroms. If R naught equals two angstroms, which again is equal to two times 10 to the negative 10 meters, it's so probably bigger than that, but it's gonna be close. Is R, like if we were gonna find R at, the, at equilibrium, would FA equal zero? No. At equilibrium, to solve for R, you need to find the point when Fa equals negative F R, when there's no net force, right? When the attractive force equals the repulsive force, negative value. Well, let me come back to that in a minute. Let's just first plug this in. If I gave you R naught, you could solve for the attractive force here. Don't agree? And what are we getting? Let me just punch this in real quick. <laughs> Well, since it's sodium chloride, you can use one. One and one. You can do negative, it's how you define it. Um, in this class, we designed positive forces as attractive. If you plug it in positive and negative, you're gonna end up with a negative force that'll throw you off. So just do absolute values if you want. That's how we've been defining it in this class. Yeah. So the value that you give is the fundamental charge. Is that fundamental charge or fundamental charge squared? That is just the fundamental charge of one electron. So you gotta square that, which I did not do. Can do it real quick? Discovered by Robert Milliken, oil drop experiment, Nobel Prize, 1909, somebody. <laughs> Neat guy. By the way, William Gibbs, the Gibbs we keep talking about, I've been reading about him. He was like a huge introvert. And he like wanted to work in isolation 
And he was amazing. He was an amazing person. A total introvert, though. Okay. I don't even know how to describe this. I'm a little confused on like the storyline of John this equation. Um. So K, here let me make it. Let me simplify. Let me simplify. K is equal to all of this stuff. Okay, that makes. And then Q, all I've done is I've said, hey, when you're ta talking about electrons, but you're talking about ions, they can have more than one at a time. They can have multiple charges of electrons, right? So is it always Q squared? Or like X? Yeah, yeah. Because that's the charge, right? You're saying there's two charges. You could you could leave Q inside these if you wanted. Two like Z one Q, Z two Q. But we just bring the Q out and square it. Okay? What if you have like a reaction between like magnesium ion and chlorine? That you would put two and one. Okay. So then yeah. Like yeah. I'm not gonna give you something like that. I'm gonna give you either monovalent, divalent, trivalent, where both of them are the same. Okay. Okay? Any questions so far on how you do this? Yeah. That will give you the right answer. Yeah, you can use the value for K if you want. I got no problems with that. Question? Do, yeah, don't get ahead of yourself real quick. Let's just do monovalent first. I want to make sure you guys get this. Are we getting the right answer? I'm getting, I get, if I've done it right, 5.769 e to the negative 9. 5.769 times 10 to the negative 9 newtons, right? So let's now take the exact same separation distance, which may or may not be realistic, but if it was, and now you're doing it like MGO, MGO is plus two and minus two, what would be the attractive force at the same separation distance of that pair of ions? The only thing different is your Z has changed. It's gonna be two for both of those. So plug in two times two. If R not the same, and I have no idea what it is for MGO and NACL. We're making crap up here. On the, on the test, I always use real values, but here I'm just winging it, right? What is it equal to? So it's a stronger force, right? To the negative eight as opposed to the negative nine, it's a stronger force. That should make sense. Coulombic law says big charge, big positive charge, big negative charge, that should be a stronger attractive force. So all things kept equal, you see a stronger attractive force. If we did trivalent, it'd be stronger still. So for any ion, if I give you a separation distance, and I told you what the ions were, you could approximate the attractive force. Because you'll need to do that. So, in this one, it says, what was the ratio of equilibrium bond distances for RO be for WX, which is plus or minus one, and then YZ is plus three minus three? Asking you to solve for R O with the equilibrium. Yeah, I'm, I, we can work through that if you want. That's not on this exam, so I'm gonna, for the sake of time, suggest we don't work through that. Okay. But let me do talk about how you solve for R naught, because that is uh, even that's not on this exam actually. Um, it's an important concept. It's not on this exam. Okay. Is it Connolly or Spencer? Spencer. Spencer. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you had, like, MgO two if oxygen was one minus. Well, if you had like calcium fluoride, CaF2 or something, then you would use two and you'd use one. These are just approximations. These aren't hard and fast rules. They're approximations. Okay? Um, they're pretty good approximations. So Anna and then we'll go, is it Emmett? Yeah. Yeah, Anna. Uh, so like in this one it says, in order to reduce our not by 10%, the energy must be increased. And that's like a true or false, but I just kind of wanted to know the concept. Yeah, let's, let's draw that. So we can, we know how to calculate attractive forces from ions. You'll need to know that. So now let's draw our potential well. Our good friend, the potential energy well, looks like this, right? Kind of like that. So the question said, can you read it one more time for us, Anna? In order to reduce or not by 10%, energy must be increased, which is true or false and why? Right, so this might be R0 minus 10% at that point. Did we have to increase energy, yes or no? Yeah, you betcha we did. Because we're now right there instead of down there. R0 is the equilibrium position. It should be the lowest energy. By definition, R0 is when it's happiest, when it's at the bottom of this potential energy well. So if you pull it apart, or if you squeeze it closer together, you have to pay for that by going up in energy. So that's a true statement. 
Okay. So, so like I'm supposed to redraw this. Or something? I would just draw that. Say R0 is by definition the bottom of this well. So if you go anywhere, make it bigger or smaller, you're going up in energy. Uh, so Emmett, no one will really. Is C1 and C2 both positive? Yeah. So somebody else asked that. Um, I've seen books that teach material science teach this both ways. Some of them plug in the positive negative. If you do positive negative, you get a negative force, and they define that as attractive. In this class, since we've defined attractive forces as being positive, go ahead and do absolute value so you get a positive value. Arbitrary. You could choose to do either way, but that's what we've been doing. So to be consistent, that's what we're going to stick with. Lily? Yeah, let's do that. So when you heat something up, at absolute zero, it's going to be at the bottom of the well. right? It's got no energy, so it's going to be in the lowest position possible. As you heat it up, you give it thermal energy, you're going to allow it to essentially slosh back and forth in the bottom of this well. The more energy you give it, the more it can slosh around, right? So how we've been drawing that oftentimes is we say, okay, these represent different increasing temperatures, these lines. And if you look at the average position at any given time with those, the average position is changing. It's actually expanding. And for the vast majority of materials, this is what happens. As you heat it up, its average position, because the potential well is not symmetric, it's not a perfect view that's you know, symmetric on both sides, it bows out on that side, most materials expand and heat them up. But see how the average position is increasing? These lines represent increasing temperatures. That's where that's coming from. It'd be more symmetric. Okay. Yeah, it'd be increasingly symmetric. Yeah, Rob? Well, what would water look like? Do first off, uh, water the ions aren't bonded to each other, right? It's a very very weak bond. But ice, they're bonded to each other. But does ice melt at a high temperature or low temperature? Very low compared to things like salt, right? So if you were going to sketch like salt would look like this, salt melts at like two or three thousand C. I don't know something crazy. But water would look like like that. How do we know that? It's got a very shallow potential well, but ice is really stiff, right? It has a high modulus. High modulus comes from having a higher radius of curvature here. So both of these have similar stiffnesses, but kind of draw those with similar radius of curvature, but one definitely goes a whole lot deeper. Yeah, Scott? So the, uh, the larger the Young's modulus, it should be more comfortable, right? Yeah. yeah. Sharper curve on the side. By the way, which is kind of why I was asking these people then. But water does expand when you, if you have a block of ice, ignore the phase transition to water. Solid ice expands when you heat it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Arthur? What's the variable that's off when you try to identify the rate average? Oh, you lost me one more time. Uh, what's the variable? Why is it called um, the variable that identifies an element by how much it pulls to the left or to the right? The For thermal expansion? thermal expansion? So they call this the coefficient of thermal expansion. And they usually write it as alpha, and they'll sometimes write CTE. CTE, coefficient of thermal expansion. We're going to come back to thermal expansion. So we haven't covered it in great detail in this class. For right now, um, I'm going to leave the subscripts off because there's some there's some nuances there that we're going to get to later this semester. Yeah. I just want to make sure I heard this right. So a uh, high Young's modulus is a a higher radius of curvature, meaning a small high curvature, small radius of curvature. Let's mix that up. Meaning it's pointy. Yeah. Yeah. Because that means that the second derivative must be large, and we know that Young's modulus is equal to the second derivative of energy. Right. Well, it's proportional to the second derivative of energy evaluated at this R naught value. <coughs> so at the bottom of that trough, is it really curved or not? If it's really curved, you got a stiff material. Yep. Uh, the question is, though, you said that we have, we have a problem in the homework that uh, asks for us to solve for R naught. What's the equation we use for that? Let me be quick about it because I don't think it's on the exam. So let me be, just quickly talk about it. If you start out with energy, energy net can be divided up into energy A plus energy R, the attractive and the repulsive terms. Uh, terms. Um, DE, DR equals F, 
Is that right? That's right. So if we take the derivative once with respect to energy uh, of energy with respect to distance, we'll end up with f. We could turn this into f net. Right. This is going to be equal to d e n d r. Right. You agree? And this is basically has f a plus f r. It's going to have two terms as well. When the net force is equal to zero, that's equilibrium. And that makes sense, right? If you've got two pieces of chalk and they have an attractive force between one another, then they're not in equilibrium, they're gonna to move together. And if they have a repulsive force, they're gonna move away. But when the attractive force and the repulsive force are equal to one another, it's in equilibrium. So when F net equals zero, that's when you can solve for R naught. So um, um, the, the repulsive force, we can't spitball as easily as attractive. Attractive is easy, it's just Coulombic attraction. Repulsion is harder because it has to do with the ions. If you have like a really big ion, something like, um, there's our credit table. Something down here like bromine is a big anion. Its size is going to interact differently than say fluorine, which is much smaller. So the repulsive term, you, you would technically have to take into account the size of the, of the ions. That's not as easy for us to do, so we don't. Instead, what we do is we say it can be approximated by the following. We approximate it by saying, let me change color. We approximate it by writing this as B over R to the N, meaning it's some constant, and then the, the, the radial dependence of it is much, much sharper than than for energy, for the attractive force, right? If we go back to this, let me go back one last thing here. So right here, sorry. So here, this is force. Just talk about this and then we'll move on. This is the attractive one. It goes as one over R squared, the force. But the repulsive term, it, it's really, really sharp and then it disappears to zero. So it has a different R dependence. It's usually R raised to the N where N is like eight or nine or 10, but it depends. And that's totally just empirically fit to real data, right? There's no first principle calculation that you can say like, oh, because of the size of this ion, N should be this. I mean, people probably do that. In this class, we're just using it as an empirical fit. Okay, any other questions with this? Or, uh, Anthony? I just feel like the question always has to be set Yeah? Easiest thing you ought to do is look up the practice exam on... If you go to files, homework, no, oh, sorry, files, midterm, you can see the practice, practice exam. This is probably taken from one of last years. She might have tweaked a little bit, but generally it's got three questions, and there's a calculation part to each question, there's a short answer, and there is a uh, true, false, or a concept one. Sometimes I do more, I could have more than three parts per question, but that's the general formula that I follow, right? So for this one, question two had an A, B, C, A, B, C. Three had an A, B, C, D, E, so I had slightly more on that one. But the general rule of thumb is a calculation for each question, which means you've got 15 minutes per question, so you really don't have much time. right? If there's three parts per question, you're going to spend twice as much on the calculation. That means you've got to be pretty quick. right? You're going to spend 10 minutes on your calculation, and the, the rest of the questions that need to be within five minutes. So you can't, you can't be dilly-dallying too much. You've got to really be quick. So don't write paragraphs. Often you incriminate yourself when you do that anyways. When you write really long answers, you end up exposing that you don't know the concept. So if you think you know the answer, just write it. Don't write more than you think you need to because you'll probably expose something that's false. Is the general way we observe. Yeah. Remember your name? Blake. What? Can you go over uh, volume fraction, like number five and number three? Yeah, so let's do that real quick. Okay, if you do the lever rule, Okay, to do volume fraction, let's start with a very simple phase diagram, just like copper nickel, right? And I cool it down, and at some temperature, I say, I want to know the volume fraction of the phases present here. We know it's alpha plus liquid, but I want to say, I want to know the volume fraction. How would you go about doing that? Let's say this is in weight percent. No, let's say even worse, it's in mole percent. How would you do it? We're not going to work it out. I'm just going to talk about the steps. If that's in mole percent going from, let's see, copper's over here, nickel is over there. What are the steps involved in this? Well, since we want to know volume fraction, that's an amount, 
Anytime I'm asking for an amount, whether it's mole or weight or whatever, you have to use the lever rule. What will the lever rule tell us? Lever rule is going to tell us the mole percent of the alpha phase and the mole percent of the liquid phase. That is not the volume fraction. What do we need to turn this into the volume fraction? Brennan. Uh, Yeah, so this will give us mass. If you use the molecular weight, you can go from moles to mass. From mass, you use the density to turn it into a volume. So using density. Does that make sense? That's the steps. Um, I'm honestly more interested that you understand the steps. Um, if you make math errors along the way, we always just do minus one point for math errors. And you'll get most of your points if I can see that you know the concept. And by the way, if you're ever running out of time on an exam, never, ever, ever leave a blank. Say, this is what I would do. These are the steps I'd follow. We're out of time. We'll get, you'll be surprised you'll get most of your points. Because this is the concept, right? This isn't a math class. I'm not grading on how well you do math. That's part of it. It's concepts I'm really after. Yeah. So if we're going to be taking the um, molarity of the alpha phase or the liquid phase, would you need, like, That's a good question. Uh, would what, what, what would you use for the molecular weight of this liquid? Right, that's liquid. The composition is composition L, right? Maybe like, I don't know, call it 20%. 20 atomic percent of nickel. So what do you use for the molecular weight? That's a really good question. How would you do this, anybody? What do you use? What do we use? Say again? If it's if that's a zero point if that's twenty atomic percent nickel, what would be the molecular weight, Brandon? What do you, what do, you do? You want to do this the same way you find the isotopic weight. You want to have. Yeah. So you know that it's twenty atomic percent nickel, right? And therefore it's eighty atomic percent copper. So what is our our net molecular weight? It's going to be zero point two times the molecular weight of nickel plus 0 0.8 times the molecular weight of copper. All right, so it's going to be somewhere in between. Just like an average. It's, we call this the rule of mixtures. Use the rule of mixtures to approximate the molecular weight. Actually, it's not approximate. You're calculating it there. It's not an approximation. You similar thing for density. And you do the same thing for the solid. Same thing. The solid, let's say that it's at, I don't know, 60... 5%, right? That's 65 atomic percent nickel. Therefore, it would be 0 0.65 times the molecular weight of nickel plus 0 0.35 times the molecular weight of copper, right? What about the densities? What do you use for densities? I don't know how on earth you estimate the density of nickel or copper. I'd probably give that to you in a question. What's that? What do you mean empirical? For the solid, that's what you would do. I'll show you the solid in a minute, but for liquid, I'd, I'd just have to give you the liquid. Unless you had a clever way to estimate it, I'd have to just give you a value for that. I don't know how you'd estimate it. You could look and see what the literature does. I don't know how to do it. Matt? How do we figure out the, the percent of the phases? So lever rule does that. Let's just really quick recap lever rule. In this question, we have three different lengths, right? We've got that length, we've got this length, and we've got the total length, right? So if, if you want to get to this mole percent alpha, how do you figure that out? Change this to something else. Figure that out, we need to do, what should it be? For alpha, mole percent alpha, what should we do? We should do, yeah, the one opposite. So it should be blue divided by pink. I apologize, anyone colorblind, that would be, you know, we'd have to plug in values to do it though, with numbers, okay? Again, so how would you figure out the density of the liquid? I'd probably give it to you. And then what about the density of the solid? You'd use the rule of mixtures again. 
So the density of alpha at that composition, it would just be equal to that composition at 65 atomic percent. So you need to convert that to mass first. When you do the, yeah, you, need, you should technically do it by mass. So you, you'd figure out what 65 atomic percent nickel is. You'd figure out that what that is in weight percent. And then from there, you'd say the mass fraction, let's just write it M1, uh, or let's do, let's do this. The mass fraction of copper, mass fraction of copper multiplied by the density of copper um, plus the mass fraction of nickel multiplied by the density of nickel. If you have questions about this, I'll be posting the solution to today's homework where we do this. I'll post that as soon as I get home so you can see how we did it there because we basically have to do it there. Okay? Yeah, Brandon? If you knew what the density of the liquids were, yeah. If you knew the density of the liquids, then you could do that. Rob? Yeah, again, if I put something like this on the midterm, it's going to take a long time. And I recognize you only have 15 minutes per question. I know that this stuff takes time. And I'm not interested in testing on how well you can do routine stuff you should have learned in Gen Chem. I'm more interested in do you understand the lever rule? Do you ever understand, you know, basic stuff that we've talked about in this class? So I'll try and make it simple for you, and I've done so on the exam that you'll see tomorrow, or on Friday. Other questions I can answer? We've got another 20-ish minutes. Yeah. Uh, Spencer. Can I go over what now? Quantum numbers, sure. Let's go over quantum numbers. If you look at your periodic table, uh, on, the, on the page that doesn't have the little crystal structure drawings on this page, Underneath it, you'll see, like for ruthenium here, it says krypton, so whatever krypton is, and then it says 4D75S1, right? So ruthenium We could write this as krypton 4D75S1, is that right? 475s1. So let's say, hey, I want to know the quantum numbers for that 5s1 electron. Right? How do you do it? What are the quantum numbers for that 5s1 electron? The one electron that's occupying that 5s orbital, how do we describe it? Yeah, Zach? Comment? Scratchy head? Yeah, fair enough. Car, how do, how do you do it? Yeah, this number here is always n. The number in front of that is always n. So n for this one, for 5s1, n equals 5. That's easy. What about s? What should s be? Zero. s is always 0. p is always 1. d is always 2. Just write it down if you need, right? Because it's an s orbital, we know that m equals 0, right? If it had been p, p, m equals 1. d m equals 2, f, m equals 3, and so forth, right? Okay, um, what about m sub l? It can be negative m to positive m, but m is just 0, so it can only be 0. What about m sub s? We always fill it first up, which is positive 1 half, and then we fill up, spin down, so it's going to be plus 1 half. So that one's easy. What about this outermost one of d7? What about that one, of the 47? How would you write that one? For 47, the outermost one, what would it be? Well, what's n? n's 4, that's easy. n is 4. Because we're talking about the d orbital, m must be what? m is 2. m sub l can be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, or 2. Any of those answers will give you credit. You can write all five if you want to be a superstar. But whatever you want, right? Now, what will m sub s be? What is it? Positive or negative? Raise your hands positive. Raise your hands negative. It is negative. Now why? We're talking about five orbitals, and it's the seventh electron. We already filled them spin up, and then the last two would be spin down. If you have a seven. Yeah, Brennan? Isn't that kind of arbitrary that you can fill all five spin down? When you take quantum mechanics, you'll learn that things go spin up first. 
And I will definitely not be going into why that is in this class. I don't even remember. I just know that it's a thing. Arthur. My question was the whole above the horizontal This thing? Yeah. The KR? You uh, No, no, but like before. Like, yeah. When you say 65 to tonic percentage, and you have to put depth to weight percentage, how do you do that? Oh, okay. How do you go from atomic percent to weight percent? It's you, all you have to do is atomic percent to weight percent. You do what? What's our steps? So let's say if you have 65 atomic percent nickel, that means that you have 35 atomic percent copper. So assume some number of atoms, say 100 atoms or 100 moles, right? So if 100 atoms total, that means that you've got 65 atoms of nickel and you've got 35 <laughs> atoms of copper, right? So then you could say grams per mole, you could turn that into mass, right? So multiply this by nickel's mass, which is 58.69, right? Grams per mole. If we have atoms, we could just as easily write 65 moles, right? Same thing, it's equivalent. Down here, we have copper, which is 63.55. Right? So now you've got, let's just punch these in. Let's do it since we're this far. 65 times 58.69, 38.14. Meanwhile, this one is 2224. So those are masses. How do we make them into a mass fraction? All right, well, we say then the weight percent of nickel is going to be equal to the mass coming from the nickel, which is 3814, divided by the total mass, which is 3814 plus 2224. This gives us. Sixty-three point times it by one hundred percent. If you want, that gives us sixty-three point one seven. Or in other words, that's almost the same as the atomic mass. Why? Because copper and nickel have almost the same weight, right? They're super, super close. If you take things that are very different, like tungsten and carbon, it'll be radically different, right? In this case, they're pretty similar because they weren't very far apart. You could have said six. We could have said 100 moles. It's equivalent. Like technically, the, the value would, since we're dividing these by one another, it's going to cancel out whatever we decide to do. So we could have done moles if we wanted. Yeah. It would cancel out though. You'll get the same answer either way. Other questions I can answer. Who's never asked a question in this class? Is it John? Got a question for me? <laughs> it's definitely not your name, I'm guessing, because you're looking behind you. What's your oh, name? Alex. <laughs> I'm not even close. All right, Alex. <laughs> I thought, um, I'm not, I thought to be pretty much everything we've gone through. Um, answered. Um, Anything on this list frightening? We got 15 more minutes. All right, Anthony. Um, yeah, one equation you need to know for that. Delta G equals negative N F delta V. Or delta, I guess I should write delta RG. Or delta RG naught equals negative N F delta V naught. Both of those equations are valid. Yeah. Yeah. We we did already, so I'm going to skip that for now. But you can refer to the video that was posted up here. It was it was here somewhere with the zinc right here, sacrificial anode. So refer back to that for the sake of time. We'll keep going. Uh, Carlos. How do you know which one is the anode cathode? Anode is where oxidation occurs. Reduction is where or cathode is where reduction occurs. I said that right. Anode is where oxidation occurs. Anode versus cathode. Anode is where oxidation occurs. Cathode is where reduction occurs. Okay. Anything else? 
Yeah, that. Percent ionic character. character. Okay, you're going to use the formula which says um, percent, we'll just write IC, right, is equal to, let's make sure we do it right, right there, it's this thing. Let me just grab that. Uh, I don't know if this will work. Maybe? It did. There you go. Fair enough? So what is in this equation? 1 minus the exponential of negative 0.25, chi A minus chi B squared. Chi A and chi B, that's your electronegativities of the two ions involved. Electronegativities, this, this probably has them on here. Doesn't really know. But on the back side, in the top right corner. So like for calcium fluoride, right? Calcium is... It's electric electronegativity is 1. Fluorine is 3.98. So 3.98 minus 1 is going to be a big number when you square it. So that's going to give you close to close to 1. 100% ionic. Not 100%, but close. Right? Whereas two things that are close to each other, like copper and nickel, that's not going to be ionic at all. So they have the same electronegativity. Yeah, Arthur? What's the equation of delta Z equals R to delta Z? Okay. It's close to the same with delta D, but isn't there like a difference? Yeah, let's write both. Um, change in free energy for reaction versus change in free energy at standard conditions. Right, that's really what it is. So uh, this thing, the change in free energy for reaction, that's delta R G, meaning there's a reaction as, as it's written, right? That's delta R G. But this change in free energy under standard conditions, that's delta R G naught. Delta R G naught can be calculated from the free energies of formation. Free energy of formation, that is delta G F naught. So basically this is for, we use this, for individual reactants and products. Whereas these ones we use for reactions. Okay? Now how do we write them? Delta R G equals delta R G naught. Also, we sometimes call this the theoretical component. Plus R T natural log of Q. And delta V equals delta V naught minus R T over N F natural log of Q. Okay? And if you wanted to, we could do one more. We could say that delta R G naught equals the sum of the delta G formation values of products minus the sum of the delta G formation values of reactants. Okay, any questions? So what's the sum of formations and not formations? Good question. Um, let me switch color. Um, equals positive spontaneous. Oh, uh, negative, sorry. Messed that up. Equals negative, then we say that's spontaneous. Whereas if this equals positive, spontaneous. Okay? One last thing if we want to write it. It's getting long. We could say delta G equals delta H minus T delta S or delta G naught equals delta H naught minus T delta S naught. All these technically should have R's because we're talking about reactions. Okay? Yep. Um, for any like, would you give us the Faraday constant if you need to solve for? I, on most of my exams, I give you the all the constants that you need, but just to be sure, put them on your note sheet. Okay.
But I do try and think, like I work through it, and if I need it, I put it on top of the equation, uh, the top of the test. Yeah. So what is the difference between the two we see in the voltage? Same, same cube. It's always products of reactants. If it's a gas, use partial pressures. If it's a solid or a liquid, you just use one. And if it's a dissolved species, like an ion solution, use concentration. Same though, same reaction quotient. Yeah, Matt? Good question. I have a giant book. You use, uh, you go to the internet and you punch in thermochemical data of pure substances. And hopefully you can find the PDF because the book is a beast. It is, and it costs so much. How much is this going to cost? Does it say? So much money. It's monstrous. So if you want to come, I can show you the book in my office. There are two tomes there. They're massive. And that's where you get them from. Where did those come from? From scientists who did a couple experiments at, to calibrate it, and then they calculated free energy from, the, from a few experiments. This was big in the 70s and 80s. Now we benefit from it because somebody did it for us. Yep. Thank you, other scientists. Thank you, 70s scientists. Yeah, Matt? Oh, I'll give it in the test. Yeah. You, I, yeah. Everything that you need will be in the test. You don't need an additional resource outside of your note sheet, the periodic table. Everything else will be given. Yeah, Carlos? Can you talk about the difference between the components? Yeah, let's do. So, difference between theoretical oops, and experimental components to change in free energy. Pretty close. Okay, right? So you've got um, delta RG depends on delta RG naught plus RT natural log of Q, where this maybe is our reaction. Let's say it's like A moles of compound A reacting to form B moles of compound B plus C moles of compound C. This is a gas, that is a gas, and that is a gas. Therefore, we can write our reaction quotient. Q is going to be equal to the partial pressure of gas B raised to the small v exponent multiplied by the partial pressure of gas C raised to the small c exponent divided by the partial pressure of gas A raised to the small a exponent, right? So the way that we break this down is as follows. This is the theoretical component. This is the experimental component. What do I mean by that? Delta RG naught, you can calculate that for any equation as it's written on paper, right? If I just write whatever equation, this thing, right? You can calculate it and it'll say it's, it's spontaneous or it's not spontaneous, but that's not telling you the whole story because this reaction right here, in order for it to go forward, you have to have some partial pressure of gas A to start with or it can't go forward, right? If if this is so small, then that makes Q really, really large, right? We agree. If Q gets large, what happens to our expression? If this is so small, then Q is big. What does natural log of Q be? It's just gonna be another big number, right? So. So RT natural log of Q becomes, um, I'm just going to type it out, becomes a big positive number, right? If that term right here, if this guy right here, the exponential, if that becomes a big positive number, then you could imagine that even if this was a big neg a negative number, that this could be a larger positive number to make it not happen. Right? Overall, when you add those together, you get a positive delta RG and the reaction is not spontaneous. So that's why we care about this, because it, it can totally flip it. It can flip a reaction which you expect to be spontaneous, and it can actually be going the other way. When you take into account what's actually in the beaker, you know, the partial pressures, concentrations, whatever it is you're talking about. Yeah, Arthur? Uh, yeah, so this is for whatever the A, B, and C are gases, but what if they're liquids? If they're all liquids, then you just ignore it. You can actually, that full term goes away. Because no, about the EV is just one. Yeah, Q is one, then natural log of one equals what? 
Zero. So that whole term disappears. Uh, what if they're a solid? Same solid. thing. Because they're all, then you just use one. Because it's, so right, you'd have one raised to the exponent, it's still just one. Multiplied by one is one. Divided by one, it's all just one. So your natural log term just goes to zero. So in that case, it's just your theoretical component. You can ignore the rest. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know who had a hand first. Carlos and Rob? Uh, so we ignore liquids and solids. Well, we don't ignore them. We just type, you can put one if you want. But you, for all intents and purposes, you can ignore them. It's just one. Yeah. So we do ignore them. All right, Rob. Um, so we're just for the sake of this course, we'll go on and pretend like liquids are not volatile at all. Like and that's that's really what we're saying. We're we're assuming that like even though alcohol, you can what's well, something you can smell like ammonia. You can smell ammonia. It clearly has like a vapor, a vapor pressure. We're assuming that that's not the case. It's like a big assumption. It's not always going to work. When you guys take thermo, you'll learn uh, better approximations. I forgot to do this. Can I have you guys really quickly scratch your name down on this? In years past, I like to quantify who comes to this, and I like to correlate it to the scores they get. Because I think, I, I'm trying to convince people to come to these things, because you'll do a lot better. So really quick, before you leave, can I have you write that down? I should just pass that soon. I, it's a no-brainer, but yeah. Takara. Uh, the partial pressure for molarity of liquids? It's a partial pressure for molarity of liquids? Like for like, for two? They gave us molarity, and we plugged that in from uh, liquid. So we, I don't think we treated it as a one. If it's a dissolved ion species, like copper 2 plus ions dissolved in a solution, that's an ion dissolved in a solution. That's not a pure liquid. So that we use concentrations for. So like aqueous, we can still tell us the amount. Yeah. If it's, a, if it's an ion dissolved in a solution, use the concentration. Uh, Blake. No, I'm not going to make a deal on this exam. Other questions? Yeah. Right in the blue. What's your name again? Trevor. Yep. Yep, we can do that. Okay, so... If some will can the can delta s oh my gosh oh did we lose it oh it's doing its thing again not cool pen I think you have to like switch it once touch it then switch it back this is a very scientific process here and then it seems to work maybe no. All right, we're almost out of time anyway, so let's just, and yet I can type. Sorry. Weird. So if delta S is negative, then entropy increases, and it can never go the other way. Basically, and, well, it, no, we, that's not true. Delta S needs to be negative. We'll just say that for it to be spontaneous. Delta S is negative, then entropy increases, and it's spontaneous. Delta H is negative, and it's exothermic. Delta H is positive, and it's endothermic. Okay? Why is that not ready? I don't know what's that ready. Other questions I can answer? Yeah. Good question. That's a good question. Um, no, this is looking pretty good. I think we covered everything. Okay, if you do have other questions, there's one more review session tomorrow. You can always swing by my office. I'm around a lot. Just swing by if the door's open. I can explain anything else that's missed. Rob? Six to eight tomorrow? Six to eight. What time is oh, that I don't know when the TA's review five session is. You can check the midterm. And if you haven't, please make sure you sign that paper. I'm curious to correlate how people did.